In this class, we will be learning the history of the built environment. Uh, so we will be looking at architecture, interior design, and furniture design and decorative arts. And we'll see how different social, political, geographic, religious, spiritual forces shaped these environments and um, what culturally, what different cultures did to uh, create a unique environment. So we'll see things that join us together in humanity and things that uh, are different culturally and throughout different time periods. And I find this to be an endlessly fascinating subject because we see things that emerge that are quite similar throughout the centuries. And then we see how people have changed over the centuries as well. But one thing that is in common through all of these time periods and all of these people and centuries is human creativity. And that is the main theme of this um, course is how ingenious and creative people have been in dealing with the natural world and using that to create shelter and space for humanity. So you might wonder why it's important to study this. Well, there's actually been new research done that the built environment very much shapes who we are. And so we shape the built environment, but the built environment shapes us. And human cognition um, really responds to the environment much, much more than perhaps you even realize. So I want you to ask yourself these questions. What kind of spaces do I feel good in? What makes me feel peaceful? Or do I, are there certain types of environments where I feel on edge? Um, think about your childhood. A lot of times uh, environments that we're around as children have a profound impact on the way we perceive the world. They've done studies that people that are asked to solve a problem within a five by five box are very limited in their thinking and then they're put outside the box, literally thinking outside the box, and all of a sudden their creativity opens up and expands. So again, the built environment affects us very much, but also your job in here is to see or forecast what might be coming up in the 21st century. So I'd like you to see this whole arc of human creativity. And as you can see here, this quote by Confucius to study the past to divine the future, how will we then use everything that's been created prior to us and move that narration forward into the future to create a better and more sustainable world for all of us. The other thing that I hope you gain from this class is the sharpened powers of observation so that when you're out in the world, all of a sudden you'll notice details that might have slipped past you before. You'll have a deeper appreciation for different materials and details and finishes and furniture and you'll know the historical contents or maybe the arc uh, of where that came from and what culture actually created that motif. And so the more that you observe what's around you, again, the richer your life will become. And I've had many students feel inspired to travel because of this class and to go see some of these amazing things for themselves. Uh, but even if you stay home and watch Netflix, uh, watching movies or whatever, you'll notice um, different things that we'll study in here will be you know, part of set designs or costume designs or different things that you um, might notice in a deeper way. And it's just going to enrich your experience uh, in your life by, by being more informed. So uh, if you would take a look at this slide, which is a Gothic cathedral, and we'll be studying Gothic design in a few weeks. But um, notice the pointed arches, the stained glass windows, the vertical lines of the space, and the feeling of expansion, um, and literally reaching up toward heaven with the architecture. So hold that in mind as you go in to look at the next couple slides. Did you notice on that stage set then that the Gothic windows with the pointed arches and the stained glass and tracery were the inspiration for those illuminated backdrops for this particular uh, Grammy stage design? 
So again, uh, perhaps by taking this class, you'll have a deeper appreciation for these moments. Another fun thing is we realize there's really nothing new under the sun. Um, in some form or another, things keep recycling and recirculating. So notice the a detail, the peplum, that little flounce on the back of the jacket um, actually was around since 1785. But we see it interpreted through the Harley Davidson catalog from 2016 in this leather version on the right. So what I'll be asking you to do in here is ask why, okay, not to take things for granted, to really look at things and notice these details and try to determine, again, what caused people to design these things. Why did they use these certain materials and motifs? What was the, the inspiration? Um, was it social? Was it political, spiritual? Or perhaps that were just the things that were at hand in their environment. Um, but what, what was the problem solving impetus? Was it to create shelter? Was it to create a sense of power? Was it to create a sense of awe spiritually? Was it to create safety? Um, and now when we look at design, ask why also. I tend to find myself walking around my neighborhood asking why when I see some of the wretched new things that are being designed, but not in a good way, okay? Um, anyway, so hopefully um, you'll be more inspired than some of the people I'm seeing designing basically stucco boxes uh, with zero creativity going up all around us. So let's take a look at some more creative solutions to the built environment. When you look at humans different solutions to creating shelter and safety for their family unit and a sense of privacy as well you can see that originally uh, people were using natural based forms and many people in the world still are using those um, that live lightly on the land you know they're using the materials that are on hand that will easily be reabsorbed once they're finished with those materials, like the dwellings you see on the left. We have a nomadic uh, Bedouin structure for um, a culture that needs to move to different water sources with their herds of sheep and so forth. Um, and so of course, having a transportable dwelling is the practical solution in that case. And then we see um, the Pueblos of the Native American Southwest and using the clay and the adobe in ingenious ways to create these multi-story dwellings. Again, um, some say for defense. And then later using um, new tools and technologies to be able to build something uh, with cut stone and so forth like you see with this bottom right example with the columns and the pediment. So again, when we're looking at these different time periods and cultures, uh, we're going to pick out these key details and materials and these mindsets that cause people to build the way that they did. I find this comparison fascinating. On your left is Scarabray, a early Neolithic dwelling in the Orkney Islands of Scotland. And here you see a culture that has used the stone that's on the island to construct their dwelling. But notice the wall unit. Um, so they have this shelf unit that they built and notice it's on the focal point wall of the dwelling and that everything is based symmetrically around that focal point wall. So we have two beds on either side and the fireplace in the middle. And if you look on the right, people haven't changed that much, have they? Notice this storage unit in a family room uh, with the focal point now, of course, being the television, but it's that same idea of creating storage space in a way that also creates a focal point. So again, people haven't changed that much. Um, you know, our bodies are the same as they were for centuries. Our visual perception is the same. Our sense of order and liking things that are symmetrical tend to be the same. And so we'll see these kind of consistencies going on throughout history. Another thing to note is that there's certain motifs 
that we'll see in the built environment that tend to be repeated throughout time and culture. So if you notice what we call a Greek key motif, um, this was something that's been used in many cultures. So we see Mesoamerican use of it on the left uh, with that carved stone panel. On the bottom center, we see the Greeks uh, use of the Greek key. And then <clears throat> that's that zigzagging interlocking pattern. Then we see an ancient Chinese piece of ceramics on the right using that. And then we also see it being used in a contemporary interior. So <clears throat> this is another one of those motifs that is thought to perhaps have something to do with the collective unconscious. And there's these theories um, by the psychologist Carl Jung that there are certain, um, again, natural based forms that tend to be repeated throughout all humanity and throughout all different times and cultures. And this is an example of that. We'll talk about the symbolism that it, of what this motif meant to the Greeks um, in our next class. When we talk about furniture design, we'll see one idea transmitted from one spot to another as well. So here on the left, you'll see a folding stool from ancient Egypt that's from Tutankhamun's tomb. And the folding stool was a seat of honor um, in Egypt. We see it being used in the center from the Greeks with the Diphros Ocladias and the deer hoof feet. Um, and then if you see that form also being used by the Romans in the Silicurilis form, which was a seat of honor for the magistrates. And um, we still use this form today. So if you've ever used a luggage rack at a hotel, it's basically the same idea where it folds in half for to be easily transportable and unfolds. This was also a battle stool, so these would often be used in what they call campaigns, where um, you know the generals were able to sit, or the king or the leader would sit at a higher level than the troops uh, by being on this stool. The form of the Curilius is still very much with us today. So if you look in any uh, design magazine or go into a home goods type store, you will see many examples of these X stools that again had their origin all the way back in ancient Egypt. Here we see a French cacatois chair from the French Renaissance in walnut and what's called a wainscot chair, meaning it's using a, a wall panel inspiration for the back. Notice the trapezoidal seat and the low stretchers. All of these were done intentionally and cacatois means to cackle or to talk. So this was a lightweight chair designed for people to be able to move it around space and sit close to each other and have a chat, okay? The low stretcher helped people keep their feet, especially women, uh, with their light slippers off the cold stone floor. And notice the shape of the seat being narrower in the back and wider in the front. This was also to accommodate the women's very voluminous uh, skirts with lots of fabric. So, when we see that same shape being used here on the, the slide from 2013 on the right, you can see it's basically the same form. Uh, again, this form is called cacatois. Do you know why Philippe Stark would name his chair Louis Ghost? That's the um, molded plastic chair you see on the right. And you see the original version of the medallion back neoclassical chair during the reign of Louis XVI on the left. Why did he call it Louis Ghost? After you take this class, you'll know why. You'll also be able to identify what um, certain terms mean. So you see the, commo the word commode here. Um, of course, we sometimes associate that with a bathroom situation, but in fact, it's the French word for convenience. And so the commode meant that the piece had drawers, and drawers were more convenient than storing your items in trunks. I don't know if you've ever tried to store an item in a trunk, but it's not that easy to get things out, right? They've got the heavy lid that you have to prop up and then dig through the trunk. And the French cabinet maker started using the drawers, um, again, the commode, and um, this shape also is called a Bombay shape. So you see these kind of curvilinear lines on the side of the piece in the French Rococo style of 1750, translated into a cleaner but still Bombay shape in Party Ray Barn from 2011. Here we have an Elizabethan, what's called a teaster bed or four poster bed. 
And note the uh, bulb, what's called a bulbous turning, those kind of rounded forms that look like a, a vase on the, the uh, posts. This bed was usually um, clad in fabric for winter months. So if you're thinking you're living in a place with no central heating and you're in England, it's quite cold, right? So the bed was designed with this canopy so that you could draw the heavy curtains around the bed and keep the body heat in. And actually more than one family member would sleep in the bed together uh, to co create more body heat as well. Um, and then you see the, of course, contemporary version of that on the left. So once again, people don't sometimes understand the origin of the form of furniture, but after you take the class, hopefully you'll have a better appreciation for that. This little settee called a canapé that was popular uh, during the French Rococo style. In this case, it's French neoclassical style. Um, was actually made to have one person sit beautifully and to display their finery. So we also see certain furniture and architectural trends that were developed to highlight a person's power. And the original furniture really was designed for that. Um, and we'll see how that's been translated through the centuries in both the built environment and in furniture design. Our equivalent of the grand staircase to make the grand entrance from the court would now be red carpet, right? So um, the red carpet is a chance for people to show off their finery and make a statement, uh, which was exactly why certain palaces and political structures were designed with these grand staircases for the, the leaders to um, put on a show basically for the populace for the populace and uh, exactly what we do with red carpet today So your job will be to learn the vocabulary and you will be getting vocabulary lists Like I said already uh, you'll be sharpening your eye for detail so that you can distinguish between different time periods different cultures um, different types of wood and details um, and also to inspire your own creative process. So hopefully by seeing some of the ingenious things people created in the past, that will inspire you to uh, create something for the future. And, or again, just inspire you to have a more creative life yourself. Like perhaps, like I said, travel more or um, go to more museums or just go out and appreciate some of these things um, in a, more profound way once you're a more informed viewer. So after studying more about the character of the time uh, between the Louis the 15th period in France and the Queen Anne period in England, you'll be able to determine which chair might be from which culture. And again, we'll leave it at that for now. So when we use the word antiquity, again, it's a term relating to architecture of the ancient past, usually ancient Greek, uh, Egyptian or Roman and Persian um, or Middle Eastern. So when we look at this type of furniture, the Thebes stool that was in King Tutankhamun's tomb, and then we see the modern version of that, you can say that design was inspired by antiquity. An antique is a work of art or piece of furniture that is was made a hundred years um, ago or more. And so anything from 1920 back would be considered an antique at this point. So what you see here is the Cubist Chair by Joseph Hoffman. And this was designed in 1910. So even though it's considered a modern classic, it's now an antique design. And um, he was part of the secessionist movement in Vienna. So we'll talk more about Hoffman later, but it's just interesting that now some of the classics of modernism are now um, with the 20, 2020s uh, are going to become antique or already have been antique for 10 years in this case. So 
Historically, set designers have very much studied the past um, to gain inspiration for their set design. So this is a Lucite um, version of a Louis XV canapé that you saw on the earlier slide. And so again, uh, I always have to see movies twice, once to follow the plot, or actually the first time I see it, I pay more attention to the set, the interiors, the furniture, the decorative arts within the scene, and then the second time watch the plot. Anyway, um, this is another example of a contemporary piece based on a past piece. When we talk about classical design, it's a term referring to the arts of Greece and Rome primarily. And uh, so when we look at something like the Parthenon from ancient Greece, um, if there's only one building that you remember in this whole class, you must remember the Parthenon because it's been the inspiration for so much architecture that came after it. And we'll dissect the Parthenon and why it's so iconic um, in two classes. But for now, just know that when you talk about something classical, it's relating to a building or the inspiration from the building like the Parthenon. So you can see on the currency of the US, uh, the classical inspiration. Uh, there was a Greek revival period in the 1800s and a lot of government buildings, college campuses, banks, um, state capitals, uh, you know, city halls all use this kind of classically inspired architecture for their blueprint or their footprint in their design. The other building that I hope you will make sure to remember from this class is the Pantheon, which was a Roman structure um, built in 27 AD in ancient Rome, but was quite unique because of its amazing concrete dome. And again, we will um, be setting that thoroughly in two classes, but know that the Pantheon, which a word that means all gods, uh, was a building that was designed to celebrate all the Roman god and goddesses in their Pantheon. Uh, that was an inspiration for many uh, neoclassical and Renaissance style buildings that came after it. Uh, and so we'll see more of those examples as we go through class. One example of a building that was inspired by the Pantheon is Andrea Palladio's uh, Villa Capra or Villa Rotunda in Italy near the area of Venice. Um, and he was directly inspired by the Pantheon, but um, this building itself, Villa Capra, ended up inspiring the design for estates and villas uh, all over the world. So another very um, important building to history and uh, we will be talking about it more thoroughly when we talk about Italian Renaissance in a few classes. As I mentioned before with the folding stool, this is another chair that you'll want to know. This is the Klismos chair and it's from ancient Greece, another classical design, but you can see that it's conforming to the form of the body. So if you even look at the shape of the back of the chair into the leg. It almost is like the curvature of the spine. Um, and notice the curved uh, back splat, um, that, that vertical piece that connects um, down to the seat. And we will, again will dissect this chair in great length um, because it's one of the ones that have become a inspiration for many other furniture designs that came after it. Classical is different than what's considered classic. Classic is something that's timeless, that it's designed in a way with restraint and things that uh, motifs or color palettes, excuse me, textures or finishes that tend to transcend time. So you can see that on this next slide of the little black dress. Um, it's a, the two slides are, you know, 100 years apart, yet they look like they could be from the same time period almost. When you look at this slide, can you identify what makes this classic? What about the forms, the colors, the 
um, shapes of things, the layout of the furniture. Why would this be considered a classic? Well, one thing is that you really can't place it in a specific time period. So classic design transcends um, fads or trends of the moment. Um, it's something, again, that you could have designed a, a year ago, five years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago. Um, and it's, it's not easy to pin it in a certain time period because, again, um, it has this kind of timeless appeal. Another term that's used often incorrectly is vintage. So vintage, um, I should say that antique is used incorrectly a lot, applied to objects that are less than 100 years old. So if it's something from the 1950s, for example, it's not an antique, it would be considered vintage. Um, and so again, this could be anything from, you know, automobiles to furniture to uh, decorative arts and so forth. So note that these kind of mid-century modern chairs that you see here um, are actually considered vintage now. One of my favorite types of design in space is what's called eclectic, um, meaning you can see from the Greek means to select or picking out. So it's taking objects and furniture and things from different time periods and making it work together harmoniously. Um, so notice that Eames furniture um, juxtaposed against the Duncan Fife neoclassical table. And then, you know, we've got this um, almost Islamic looking floor tile. So again, it's being able to take things from different cultures, different time periods, and then using good design and proportion, be able to um, successfully wed them together in a space. So your question could be, what makes a design successful? What makes a design withstand the test of time and something that people seek out and want to use over and over again? And usually that has to do with the principles and elements of design, the way we perceive things in our environment that are either something that makes us feel comfortable and happy in that environment or something that uh, makes us feel uncomfortable. And so again, we'll see um, that is the basis for good design. So let's talk about what some of those prop principles are. An important part of design is a sense of scale. And that is the size of one whole item in relation to another. So a sense of scale would be the size of a person up next to a building. Is the person feel, do they feel dwarfed or diminished by this giant imposing structure? Or is it designed for human scale where it feels welcoming and something that doesn't feel dominant in the landscape? Um, it was said that you can always tell if societies what they value the most by whichever building was largest in the city. It used to be that the cathedrals were the largest. Now our financial institution buildings in the city skyline are the largest. So scale is different than proportion. Proportion has to do with the relative sizes of parts within the whole, meaning how big is a piece of this to, in relation to another piece. So for example, if you're looking at the proportions of the human face, it would be how long is the nose compared to the length of the ear? <clears throat> how long is the ear compared to the width of the mouth? How high is the forehead compared to the length of the nose and so forth? Those are proportions of the face, but <clears throat> proportion um, naturally occurs in nature in uh, different ways that create a harmonious rhythm and expansion, which we'll see in our next slide. So this naturally occurring proportion that exponentially grows as a plant grows, for example, is called divine proportion. And that's using what's called a Fibonacci number sequence um, to help define that. So if you look at the way a nautilus shell expands out, for example, from a small shell to a larger one, <clears throat> the sequence would be you're taking one plus two, that equals three. Then you take two plus three, that equals five. 
Then 3 plus 5 equals 8, 5 plus 8, 13, and things kind of expand out in these incremental proportions. And this is what's called also a golden um, rectangle. So we will take a look at that also when we can see, again, <clears throat> the way things expand. But you can notice this here on the way the sunflower rays out or these succulents and so forth. Um, that's all, again, how plant forms and animal forms also to have, tend to have these kinds of um, divine proportion sequences in their design. So with Arne Jacobsen, who is a famous Danish modern designer, uh, he said proportion is really what makes something appealing. And you can see that proportion being used in his design of the egg chair, uh, another mid-century classic. But uh, again, we'll notice when something's out of proportion or out of balance, and uh, that tends to make us feel uneasy. But when it has a good proportion and balance, then again, it tends to be a successful design. One reason why the Parthenon is so celebrated is it's using, again, that divine proportion or golden ratio, golden mean in, <coughs> in its uh, design. And it also shows this great sense of balance because you've got everything symmetrical across a vertical axis. We've got four columns to the left and four columns down the right. If you draw that vertical line down the center of the building from the top of the pediment, that triangular shape down. The columns also create a rhythmic pattern. And you might not be aware that things have a visual rhythm. So when you look at this, it looks you know, column opening, column opening, column opening, one, two, one, two, one, two. That creates a visual beep on the facade of the building. And that proportion is also creating a sense of harmony, that everything feels like it's in the right place and it all works together as one cohesive unit. So as I said a moment ago, design has visual beats. And so you can see that here at the Peacock Room, a masterpiece of the aesthetics movement, which we'll study in a several classes from now. But notice the design of the um, shelving to house the Chinese porcelain collection has this kind of rhythmic quality as it goes across the room or the placement of the light fixtures. So it can have like a one-two rhythm where it's like big, little, big, little. Or if you think of a black and white checkerboard, that's a one, two beat, black, white, black, white, black, white. Things can have a waltz rhythm like that. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. So if you think of like column, window, window, column, window, window, column, window, window, that's a waltz rhythm. Another thing that makes design successful is the idea of using unity with variety and also repetition. Um, so think to yourself, what gives these things, what unifies these elements? Is it uh, the shape, the size, the color, the material, all of the above? What gives these elements variety? And what do I mean by ordered repetition? Remember I had mentioned the collective unconscious. This is another example of that. We have a Navajo rug on the left and an African rug on the piece of textile on the right. And notice they have share very similar uh, motifs. The cross, what we call lost in shapes, which are those elongated diamonds, um, the rhythmic pattern. And so even the color with the black, um, think of yourself, think to yourself, why are these two different cultures in two far flung areas that are far, far apart from each other um, using the same motifs? So we'll talk about what some of those motifs might mean to our um, subconscious. Here we see another motif that's been used in many different time periods and cultures, which is called the Tree of Life. So you see an Egyptian version, a Mesopotamian version, and the Mayan version. And um, it's thought that it represents many things, but one is tree, the tree itself, obviously, where it's rooted to the ground, but it's reaching up to heaven. And we'll see many examples of this idea of connecting heaven to earth in various cultures and time periods. Um, it's also thought, you know, interestingly, that perhaps people intuited that trees were giving us life. And as we know, trees actually do give us life on this planet by, um, you know, producing oxygen. And then also it was thought with the Egyptians and their uh, habit of mummification that perhaps the tree of life also represented the spinal cord 
and the nervous system in the body. So um, again, mysterious, something that we'll see repeated over and over throughout time and space and culture. So as we look at all these different designs throughout history, I'd like you to notice these elements of design, you know, including the use of line itself, texture, light, color, patterns, values, meaning contrast of light and dark, and how does all of these things help us perceive something in a certain way? So speaking of elements of design, in the beginning of mankind, um, the line was the primary communication tool, and it really still is. Um, and so our, where we're going to start this whole conversation of design is with some of the oldest known cave art by humans. Um, this is found in Indonesia, and you can see it's showing a, a dwarf buffalo and then these small figures that um, in some cases are hybrid. So it's showing human slash animal figures with humans with horns on their head and some instances tails. This is the oldest cave art now discovered by humans, but there is even older cave art that was done by Neanderthals from about 64,000 years ago that was recently discovered near Gibraltar in Spain, which gives us a sense that the Neanderthals weren't quite as, um, I guess, undeveloped as we might have thought, that they actually had quite a lot of similarity to humans. But uh, let's take a look at some of the other cave art um, and why we're talking about it again is this is the beginning of people trying to make sense of the world and translate it through a visual medium so that other people can share in that experience. The cave art is quite mysterious and there's still a lot we don't know about it, but we're starting to believe that the primitive or early uh, mankind, the Stone Age people, were much more advanced in their thinking than we previously realized. So it's now thought that some of the cave art is showing astronomical events. Um, and this particular illustration, uh, it was said to be showing things like comet strikes or perhaps a constellation in the sky of stars, um, even being able to record the summer um, equinox or the spring and fall equinox and the summer solstice and the winter solstice. So again, people were probably much more advanced than we realized, but notice that things haven't changed all that much. We still are using lines, on this case on a stone wall, or lines on a computer screen or lines on paper to help communicate a concept to someone else. So we talk about prehistoric, um, you know, there's some of these cave arts date back thousands of years. Um, so for example, Chauvet Cave that we're gonna see next, the paintings were made about 32,000 years ago, uh, but <clears throat> we're talking about paleo Paleolithic time period where people or what's called the Old Stone Age, where people were hunter-gatherers and using crude stone tools to create um, you know, their basic needs and typically using natural rock formations of outcropping of rocks or caves for security and um, you know, a, a uh, dry place to get out of the weather and also be protected from predators. And there were some very formidable predators during this time. So for example, in this cave, Chauvet Cave, there are paw prints from cave bears in the soft clay. Um, this was the time period of the woolly mammoths, which are quite large animals, and cave lions and panthers. So um, <clears throat> again, people it was thought people took shelter in these caves to get away from those large predators. But also it was thought that they were using the caves to create a record um, of different animals, but also a, to, um, a spiritual aspect of a connection to these animals. So what you're seeing here is they're using the contours of the walls of the cave and by using um, different kinds of techniques, such as an airbrush technique where they're taking a hollow bone and ground up pigment like charcoal <clears throat> in a, a bowl, if you will, and then they're using one bone to kind of siphon the pigment up 
and then the other one to blow it out and it's using this kind of airbrush technique. And it was thought that these were had these ritual or sermonic purposes that people were going in here to do some kind of a spiritual practice. What's what's remarkable about this kind of art is you can see they're using, like I said, the contours of the cave walls to help create a sense of depth on the animal. And then by shading with the charcoal and the other pigments like red ochre, they're able to create highlight and shadow. So it creates a three dimensional effect. And then also by overlapping the forms of the animals, they're creating that sense of three dimensional effect also. So you can see people were already um, being able to create that illusion of depth on a flat surface. But the techniques varied from, <clears throat> again, scraping the walls smooth and painting and etching or creating outlines around the animals. Um, and this cave was sealed by a landslide 29,000 years ago. So that's why the art is so well preserved and it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site now. Another notable cave in southwestern France is Lascaux Cave, um, and these paintings are estimated to be about 17,300 years old. Um, the entrance was discovered in 1940 by an 18-year-old young man who was out rambling around in this area, and, and many of the caves were, the entrances were covered by landslides and so forth. Um, there were, um, the, unfortunately, because the cave had been open since the 1940s, black mold started to take a toll because uh, people had been going freely into the cave to see this art. So the black mold was creating these dark patches, damaging the wall pigments. And um, let's take a look at some of the famous, they've actually recreated this whole cave um, so that you can visit and see what it's like inside the actual cave, but the actual cave is closed off now. This cave contains nearly 2,000 images of everything from horses, deer, cattle, and bison. And this particular section of it is called the Great Hall of the Bulls. And there's a 17 foot long black bull, which is one of the largest of the paintings. But there's also prehistoric star charts relating to the constellation of Taurus and the Pleiades, the Summer Triangle. And the interior of the cave is illuminated by the setting sun on the summer solstice. So um, again, thought that perhaps it was used for religious or spiritual purposes to come in and do some kinds of painting um, to connect with natural forces or spiritual forces. So this are examples from Altamira Cave in northern Spain, discovered in 1880. And when it was discovered, it opened up a heated debate at the time because people didn't think that prehistoric um, humanity had the capacity to draw things like this. Um, so the person that discovered it, who was an amateur archeologist named Satoyoya, um, he discovered it in 1879. His, actually his little daughter discovered it. Um, they were out hiking and his six-year-old daughter um, saw a small opening when inside the entrance had been covered by a fallen tree and they reopened it and the paintings were so well preserved that again he was accused of fraud so it wasn't until 1902 he was vindicated but he had died 14 years earlier because it really challenged people's perceptions again of what they thought early humanity was possible um, to do so you can see the um, complexity of some of the images. And on the next slide, you'll see how vast this network of art is inside this cave. It goes into different chambers and different areas. Um, and also what's quite moving about it, because you'll see the airbrush use of the hand, of putting your hand up. And so, you know, this is something humanity's done since the beginning, uh, wanting to have this say, I've been, I lived, I was here. Um, and you can see that with these hand paintings that were done either um, by stenciling around the hand with an airbrush technique to create the hand as a negative space. And you can see the red ochre around it or again, outlining the hand and then filling it in with the red ochre.
As you can see, cave art is found all over the world. And um, a new discovery fairly recently, it was from 2013, um, th this cave art was found in the San Carlos mountain range in Mexico. And there's about 5,000 images. Um, you can see they're using the cleft in the rock here to create this eye shape. But the images are thought to relate to religious um, thoughts or you know religious ceremonies, astronomical symbols, symbols again that relate to the astronomy of the heavens and the stars, scenes of hunting and gathering. And um, it has not been carbon dated yet, as far as I know. So we're still not quite sure how old these cave paintings are. The under other interesting thing about the cave art is that it gives us hints about what the environment was like during this time period. So we can see the climate has changed because in this cave, uh, they're showing scenes of things like crocodiles and kind of savanna type or marsh-like creatures, where in fact, this is in Algeria on the border of Libya, which is now a very, very dry desert. So we can see over the centuries, the climate has changed in this area. There's cave art in Australia, in the Bradshaws that go back 70,000 years old. Um, again, the Cave of the Hands that you saw from Argentina is about from 7300 BC. And we even have, you know, petroglyphs that are carved in rocks, again, in different parts of the world, like in the Pacific Islands, uh, there's all kinds of petroglyph carvings that date back, you know, centuries. So, again, it's that need for people to make their mark and say, you know, I was here. Uh, this is another example of what is considered to be maybe a shamanic looking being because it looks like a human, but it's got the, the antlers or the horns and then these kind of um, horn-like shapes on the arms and then kind of overlapping the figure of the animal. So is it trying to merge with the spirit of the animal? Uh, we're not sure. Now we get to a fascinating uh, discovery that was made not too long ago. Um, this is Gobekli Tepe, and this is the world's first architecture, really. It was built 12,000 years ago, and it was used as a site for 1,000 years, but then it was backfilled, meaning it was filled with dirt and abandoned after that, and we don't know why. But it's known for having these T-shaped columns that would have supported a roof, uh, these T-shaped stone columns are made from limestone. And um, the other thing that is fascinating about it is it's some, believed to be some sort of a religious structure. So these are the world's oldest known megaliths. There's 200 of these giant pillars in about 20 circles. Each of these pillars are 20 feet high. Each are estimated to weigh about 10 tons. And um, this really changes our whole thinking about humanity because it was thought the first structures were about commerce or bringing people together in city centers. But this oldest structure is a spiritual place. So it brought people together to create a special place for um, burial practices and connecting to ancestors and so forth. So we'll talk about that more in detail on the next slide. So the name Gobekli Tepe means pot-bellied hill and it's found in Southeast Turkey. Um, again, it's thought to be um, a, some kind of a religious structure because of these images. Uh, and we don't know why it was abandoned, but it predates, for example, Stonehenge by about 6,000 years. And so um, this, these symbols that you can see here on this particular model, it's like the scorpion and the vulture, there's lions, bears, gazelles being depicted. And it was thought that this was again, a spiritual center. So it was thought that people took place in what's called a sky burial here, meaning that when someone died, they would leave their body out on the roof of the structure for the vultures to come and pick their bones clean. And then the bones would be buried in the, underneath the floor of the structure. Um, this was discovered in 1994 by a German archeologist. And um, again, it was a, there was a hill and then they realized it was an artificial hill that had been filled in. And then they, as they dug into the hill, they discovered this amazing uh, complex.
these are some of the what was thought to be ancestral figures because see how they have hands and they're also wearing loincloths so it's thought that those monoliths might be depicting um, people because they have this kind of tall upright with almost like a head shape at the top and um, again the, with the carving so this also upends uh, our knowledge of the fact that people were able to carve these more complex art forms uh, much further back than we realized and there's certain symbols on here you can see almost like the letter H uh, there's other symbols that are said to represent as above so below which is an important spiritual concept for many different religions and um, we'll see you know there's still a lot that needs to be discovered about this place but uh, again the, the main takeaway is that it changed our perception of what was possible and what people might have been thinking um, thousands of years ago that they were much more sophisticated and complex in the way they were um, worshiping and constructing uh, edifices like this than we realized another discovery that changed our perception of early man and humanity is Scarabray on the Orkney Islands of Scotland um, this settlement is older than the pyramids and it was totally covered also until in 1850 the a huge storm uncovered the ruins and uh, was left just kind of to its own devices for decades but then 1913 the site was plundered and unfortunately some of the artifacts were removed over one weekend so in 1927, it was determined that the site should be preserved and it's now a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Um, there's dwellings for about 50 people here and they're what's called earth sheltered dwellings, meaning that are digging down into the ground and creating, um, you know, these stone walls and then they would have some kind of a thatched roof. So let's take a closer look at Scarabray. Oh, one thing to note while we're on this slide is note the connecting passageways uh, between the different dwellings and, and it's thought perhaps different uh, family units lived in these different um, circular areas, but that were connected by these internal passageways or corridors. So when we look at that term Neolithic, um, this is New Stone Age. It's when people started to settle at near reliable food sources and starting to um, create agriculture uh, which is different than the paleolithic people that were hunter-gatherers and wandered from food source to food source so we start to create um, this idea of settlement and having people band together to work cooperatively to bring in a crop for example so when we look at the um, this time period and they're using the uh, materials at hand the different flagstone and so forth but let's take a look at the interior a little closer. If Gobekli Tepe is the first architecture that has been identified at this point, then I would say Scarabre is one of the first interior designs that we've seen identified at this point. So notice the stone built furniture, including cupboards, dressers, uh, seats, storage units. Um, they even had a primitive toilet you can see over on the side with drainage uh, they had small slots in the wall for windows and you might think well why were the windows so small but notice this is on a northern island in a um, very cold windy area so by having these smaller windows they, they stayed warmer um, and also they had a large bed on the right and a smaller bed to the left so it's not some people proposed that the larger bed was for the males to sleep in the smaller beds for the females it makes sense to me that the larger bed might have been for um, a family you know a couple with a smaller might have been for children um, so again there's a lot we don't know but they we do know that they burned seaweed for fire and they were fishermen and hurt and they herded sheep and the spiral was a main motif for them So these jadeite um, stones have been found in the site that were carved and we don't know their use was it, you know were they currency or money were they trade items were they a game were they a religious symbol 
of some significance were the marks on the stone marking off a calendar dates. Again, we're not sure what these were for, but they're quite intriguing. So here's another one of those motifs we'll see repeated in many different cultures, and that's the spiral. And notice the spiral design, this is kind of a tight double spiral um, seen here both on the Scara Bray artifact and the facial tattoos from the Maori people of New Zealand. And you might think, well, what do they have in common? Well, think about that, both on islands. So where are they getting maybe this spiral in inspiration? We will see several UNESCO World Heritage Sites, and I'll try to point those out <clears throat> as we go through the class. But um, it, it means a landmark or an area selected by the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. That's what UNESCO stands for. And that it means that it has cultural, historical, or scientific uh, significance to humanity. So therefore, it's legally protected by international treaties, and um, they are not to be uh, destroyed or bothered in any way. Now, unfortunately, not everyone always um, oh, adheres to UNESCO's designation, and we'll see some examples of heritage sites that have been destroyed recently. But um, you know, there's there's several you know throughout the world there are many um, World Heritage sites, and it's at this point there's about 878 of them uh, located all over the globe. And we still find people living in Spain. So for example, in southern Spain near Granada, there's um, a long history of people still living in caves and have created homes from cave dwellings. Or if you're looking at a mid-century modern design by Eero Saarinen of an airport terminal and these organic forms with textures that uh, reference the shapes of perhaps being in a large cavern or cave. When we look at ancient civilizations, we can see what's widely thought of as the birthplace of civilization, which is Mesopotamia, meaning that this is the place where people sure started bringing in, um, building city-states with structures that have withstood the test of time. So of course, they're ancient civilizations that are way be before this, such as the Aboriginal um, people of Australia, but we are focusing on the built environment. So these are civilizations, again, that had buildings that um, have withstood all of these centuries and things that we can still um, study today to learn more about ancient civilizations. So we're gonna be talking about Egypt first. Next week we'll talk, or next class, we'll be talking about Mesopotamia. And then, of course, uh, India, which is another ancient civilization, China. Uh, we'll talk about Greek and Rome and the early Mediterranean cultures next week, next class and the following. And then um, ancient African cultures as well. So if you look at Kush there, that's uh, modern day Sudan. And then some of the ancient civilizations in Mesoamerica, such as the Olmecan um, civilization and the Incan civilization in the Andes region. So we will um, be touching on some of these cultures and of course each of them are very complex and remarkable and you could spend a lifetime just studying one so this class is very much an overview where unfortunately we're just going to be able to kind of skim the surface but hopefully perhaps pique your interest so that you might explore further on your own about these different cultures One reason that we're starting with Egypt is that Egyptian art and style is so recognizable and it's been so constant. So you can see it's something that um, lasted over the centuries, over 30 different dynasties and um, very iconic today. So when we look at Egypt and why the art has stayed so constant, it's because their environment stayed so constant. The culture changed very little for 5,000 years, and because it was all based on the Nile, the river and the Nile, and the annual flooding from the south um, with higher altitude snow melt flowing down to the river delta basin and out into the Mediterranean. 
Um, also constant because it's very close to the equator. So the sun felt very balanced in the sky with the night. It's typically full sun under a cloudless sky with very little rainfall. And this constancy of the predictable flooding of the Nile and the predictable weather patterns of the day uh, made this feeling that life just goes on eternally. And it's thought that this shaped their attitudes about the afterlife, that after you died, that you know things would just continue on and so that you needed to be able to be prepared with everything that you had in this life to be able to take that into the afterlife. Um, and so it's thought again that because the life cycles were so constant, this uh, formed this belief of the way um, the afterlife was going to unfold for a person. Here we see statues from the old dynasty and uh, the old kingdom that was from the fourth to eighth dynasty. And this was the time period that the great pyramids were built. So the Egyptians uh, would typically depict male figures with darker skin tones and female figures with lighter skin tones like you see here. And the figures were very brightly painted. When we th see things now that they're all weathered and stripped of, of color, we tend to think of this sort of um, more, I guess, uh, I wouldn't say classy, but just a little more restrained design aesthetic, when in fact they were very brightly colored and very um, almost playfully colored design aesthetic in all of the, the um, architecture, art, and decorative arts that will be seen coming up. So here you see the Nile, which is Africa's, um, it's actually the world's longest river. Um, and you, it's in a valley that's 10 miles wide in some points and then a little wider than the river itself in other points. And um, again, it was the life blood for Egypt because it flooded predictably. Um, they were able to control the river's floods, distributing water by building dikes and reservoirs and canals. And this um, type of engineering was used not only for irrigation for crops, but it was also used in their building practices, which we'll talk about next. Uh, but again, notice it's kind of counterintuitive to us because the river's flowing from south to north. So it's starting down um, in the southern part of Africa and flowing north up to the Mediterranean and, and fanning out at that delta area that you see that triangular shape. Um, going into the Mediterranean. Another reason Egyptian art stayed so unchanged for centuries is that Egypt itself was very protected by its environment. Um, beyond this very lush river valley, it lay very harsh desert, which made it very difficult for people to invade Egypt. Um, it created protection against invasion or even visit from visits from outsiders. So because Egyptians were so isolated and they were able to develop their culture uh, without a lot of influence from the outside world. And um, when we look at some of the forms and details of the architecture, uh, again, it was mainly the, remained very much the same for four to 5,000 years. Now, when you look on this map, you can see some of the significant um, building structures such as the Temple of Ramses, the Temple of Luxor and Karnak, um, and then of course the Great Pyramids of Giza up by the River Delta, um, and the Sphinx and some of the different things we'll be talking about now coming up, all located along the Nile, which was also used of course for transportation. So they were um, using the Nile to help transport goods to build these structures, you know, going up and down the river. This is the Nile as seen today from modern day Cairo, um, which is now built on either side of the banks of the Nile, but it's unfortunately now one of a very polluted river in this section because of the dense population growth around it. The Egyptian gods and goddesses, just some of whom are seen here, uh, were taken from natural forms. And unlike many cultures, they had a sky mother and an earth father. Oftentimes we'll see in most cultures, it's an earth mother and a sky father. 
But in this case, you've got Newt, who's the sky mother, and Geb, who's the earth father. And then there are different children. And then uh, the deities consist in many different manifestations. So many of the gods will be depicted in more than one form. So a lot of times there's these kind of triads of mother, father, child, or pairs. So if you look at the god Amun with the tall headdress on, um, he's the god of hidden power. And then if you see that tall headdress with the solar disk of Ra or Re, the god of the sun, when you see Amun-Ra then, that's the united, that's the power that lies behind all things because of the sun. So, for example, if you see, um, you know, a plant growing, that would be Amun-Ra because it's the power of the sun in the plant, if that makes sense. So um, we'll see these kinds of uh, composite people where you can see Anubis, for example, the man with the jackal head or Horus, um, the man with the falcon head. And so we see these kind of represented in different um, art forms. The Egyptians believed, as we know, life after death. So they believed that the soul had a special set of characteristics unique to each person, and that soul would wander at night but then return to the body each night. And if, if it's the mummified body, it would return to the mummified body also. And that this life force must continue to receive offerings of food and um, things that they need even after death. So this is thought to have created this um, need to create these large tombs for the pharaohs or who are the, um, the leaders of, of the realm, right? So um, the word pharaoh means great house. And so that was the name these for their ruler. And so, of course, we see the most famous of these, which is the Great Pyramids of Giza. And um, the center one, the largest, is the Pyramid of Khufu, which is considered one of the seven wonders of the ancient world and still seven wonders of the world today. So it was built during the fourth dynasty. Originally, it was 480 feet tall. Now it's closer to about 450 feet tall because of the sand. You know, it's sunk into the sand, but the sand's built up around the base also. It's 750 feet in length on each side. Uh, there's many mysterious things we still don't understand about the construction. So the mortar is some kind of unknown composition that they're still determining. Um, it's located in the very center of all the Earth's land mass. So if you were to take all of the land of Earth and put it together, the pyramid would be right in the middle of that. Um, the sides of the pyramid are slightly concave, seen from aerial views too, to create um, compensate for visual uh, distortion in our, our visual perception. So there's actually three pyramids here, Menkari, Khafre, and Khufu. Um, the three are precisely aligned with the belt of Orion. So if you know that constellation Orion, the hunter in the sky, these three pyramids are aligned with that. There's 20 or there's 2,300,000 stone blocks weighing anywhere from 2 to 50 tons each that compose the pyramids. Um, some are think the blocks were cast in cement or they were cast cement that created these blocks. The interior of the pyramid is constantly at 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, the corners have a ball and socket construction capable of dealing with heat, expansion, and contraction. And the passageway into the Great Pyramid of Giza is aligned to true north. So again, there's very many fascinating things about the construction that we're still trying to understand. This slide, this slide and the next one will give you a sense of the scale. So you see these two little guys here standing on the side of one of the blocks of the pyramid. And on the next one, you can see them on the side and you can see how massive these structures actually are. The original pyramid, the pyramids were originally covered with polished limestone uh, to reflect the sun's light. As a matter of fact, the Egyptians called them Iket, which means glorious light. And it was thought that they were capped in either black onyx or gold. And um, they were so bright and shiny, it was said you could see them from miles around or even out into space. They were built over a 10 to 20 year period, uh, which means that you could, they would be laying about 12 blocks put in place every hour around the clock. And now it's now thought that they were uh, created by skilled work people, not slaves, 
because they've found uh, worker settlements now. Um, they've excavated settlements around the pyramids that look like it housed a large workforce. Um, and, you know, with the tools and the technologies, it was thought that the they were trained workers that were, um, you know, creating these structures. One of the iconic pieces of art from antiquity is the Sphinx, the Great Sphinx, um, made from limestone with the face of the man and a body of a lion. Another one of the composite creatures we talked about will be seen quite a bit in these early cultures. Um, it's 240 feet long and about 66 feet high, uh, thought to be built in the fourth dynasty by Khafre, and it's co considered to be a garden, guardian of the pyramid. However, now they're realizing it has water damage, weathered by water, which could make it older than the pyramids. Um, so the, it has water damage that the pyramids themselves do not exhibit. So that's why they're thinking it could have been placed there first. Um, the Egyptians called it the terrifying one. You might notice that the nose had been chiseled off by iconoclasts who believed that um, this was centuries later, that um, people shouldn't be depicting the human face. What you're seeing here is a unique type of scan that they've been doing on the pyramids um, using 3D technology, and it's called um, using what's called muons. And muons are these subatomic particles that are always showering down on Earth but they can be mapped. And much like an X-ray, they can see what is solid and what's a void space. So by mapping the muons coming down into the pyramid, they've actually discovered two new cavities in the pyramid, one um, above the central shaft and another one on the side. So they're thinking the one on the side might have been a staging area for the construction. And the one above might have been to take some of the weight off um, over the, the central chamber, but they're not sure what's in those two void spaces. So again, there's still things we're learning about these mysterious structures. So the representation of the pharaoh and the queen at this time of the old dynasty would be done with this very stiff pose um, stride. You can see the left foot is extended, but without a hip shift. Um, they have a, you know, facing forward we know it's a marital pose because um, the, the woman having her arm around the man and um, the fact that her feet are more parallel or just her one foot slightly forward shows her of a lower rank where the pharaohs are usually shown in this kind of striding, more powerful position. And um, notice they use the proportions of a fist to determine how tall to make the figure um, 18 fists tall from heel to hair. Here we see smaller burial um, tombs of pharaohs. And again, these were um, considered chambers where they could live on after death. So there's a quote, it says, you have not gone away dead, you have gone away alive, which begins a ritual from the ancient Egyptian pyramid texts um, and also often inscribed in pyramid burial chambers. So these chambers had the mummified body of the pharaoh or whoever person was in there of importance, um, including things such as um, food, symbolic dishes and pitchers, food and drink, servants, not actual servants, but little statues that are representing servants, uh, jewelry, amulets for protection, even things like chariots, games, uh, hunting equipment. And so again, anything that they might need in the afterlife would be housed within these chambers. Now, unfortunately, most of these chambers were looted over the centuries. And so, uh, you know, there was the, the Egyptologists kept had keep looking for um, burials that were intact so they can um, study in more complete detail. These entranceways to the tombs <clears throat> are what's called a pylon shape. And a pylon is a monumental gateway to, in this case, an Egyptian tomb, or it's sometimes used for an Egyptian temple. The shape mirrors the hieroglyphic um, symbol for horizon. So it's um, thought to be representing, if you can see that horizontal cornice across the doorway, 
<clears throat> that's meant to represent the horizon with the sun rising above that. And so the two vertical shapes on either side are representing the hillsides or the walls of the valley. <clears throat> so it's meant to emulate the idea of the sun rising and setting for eternity and this idea of um, life going on everlasting, just like the sun itself. The Egyptians painted on dry plaster um, with tempera type paint to create their frescoes. But they had this ingenious use of water to keep the register or the bands of pattern level. So they would fill this chamber with water and then they would lower the water level or drain it out a little at a time. And then they would mark the register or the horizontal band with a line of charcoal and then incise a line at the wall too. And this ensured that the, um, the pattern would stay level, even if the floor was not, because the floor was made from chiseled stone. Uh, so again, if you were trying to measure up off the floor, you know, the floor might be a half inch lower on one side than the other. So this way they were able to keep all of the, the bands level. So again, they would sketch out the shape of the figures in charcoal first, then incise them with line and then paint um, on the dry plaster. And here we see the Temple of Karnak, which is the second largest religious site in the world after Angkor Wat Temple in Cambodia. Uh, the construction started in the Middle Kingdom and it was added onto by 30 different pharaohs over many eras. And it was um, in honor of Amun-Ra, the creator deity and um, said to be the champion of the poor. But um, this was involved in different rituals that they would do for a good harvest. And they would have a processional from this temple of Karnak down to Luxor, which is a mile and a half uh, down the Nile River. But notice the axial plan. So these temples were always laid out with a, if you think of a line going down the center and then symmetry on either side of that. And these rose sphinxes that help create this sensation of traveling you know, through space and you're traveling into what's called a hippostyle hall which is a hall full of columns um there's about it's about 54,000 square feet in this hall with 134 columns um and this was a place of pilgrimage for about 2,000 years and so the pilgrims would go in but only the pharaoh and the priests and stuff could go down into the inner sanctum so like we'll see in other structures like the forbidden city for example in china the outer realm is for more the public and the further back you go in the building, the more sacred and the more restricted um, access they would have had. So when we talk about um, hippo style, it means under columns. So again, it's this hall structure filled with the columns we'll see next. So these amazing 70 foot tall ca carved columns are supporting what's called an architrave. Those are those horizontal members spanning from side to side between the columns. And each of those architraves weigh, it's estimated about 60 tons each. So again, how did they get these massive stones up on top of these 70 foot columns? It's, it's quite remarkable. Um, these, again, were, this whole um, center was used for this festival that, um, was what's called the Opet Festival. And these temples actually supported a whole economy around them. So there was not only the priestly class, but artisans that worked on the temples, of course, people that needed to supply food and other things for the artisans and the people living there. And so they created their own um, economy around these, these temples. But in the spiritual realm, they were proceeding from the human world to the divine, taking this journey. And so the duty of the Pharaoh is to carry out temple rituals um, that were rituals also carried out by the priests. And again, they were having, they had, would have musicians and different people, dancers and chanters that would be part of these um, rituals that were all part of the temple economy. And here we see the temple of Luxor, which is on the east bank of the Nile. Um, and it's just down from Karnak. They are also using the axial plan, as you can see, and um, these, this was begun by uh, Amenhotep III and completed by King Tutankhamun. And using visual perception tricks, um, they were making the different 
uh, elements of different heights look aligned. So they had a very sophisticated knowledge of visual perception and how to use that to create the biggest impact um, in the setting. This was the um, temple that was built unusually by Ramses II, who was a very powerful pharaoh, one of the most powerful, who lived to be 91 years old. And it's quite unusual that they built a temple for themselves like this. So it kind of gives you an idea of, of his mindset. It was said that he had red hair and um, he was a follower of uh, Seth or Seti, the god Seti. And this whole temple was taken apart piece by piece and relocated in 1968 because they put in what's called the Aswan Dam on the Nile. And this whole temple would have then been in underwater had they not moved it. So you can see how close it is to the water on the next slide. Another unusual thing about this temple is the celebration of his wife Nefertari. Um, so this whole temple complex was to commemorate a battle and Kadesh um, as a victory. And so the whole thing, um, there's a black granite doorway inside a Hippostal Hall, which you'll see on the next slide. And the upper half of the walls is alabaster, the lower half red sandstone. And you can see it's decorated to the goddess Hathor um, on the inside of the temple of Queen Nefertari. primary form of construction that the Egyptian Jews is what's called trabeated or posted lentil construction, which is using a vertical post or upright to support an architrave or a lintel spanning between columns. So we saw that already at the Temple of Karnak, and you can see it next on the next slide of the Temple of Moreau, which is in which was the area called Kush, which is now modern day Sudan. And it was a sun temple to Amun, um, the sun god again, and the god of hidden power. And um, notice the lotus flower columns, and there's tribute to the goddesses uh, Hathor and Bess. And this temple that you'll see on the next slide is also had blue and yellow floor tiles at one time. So an early use of glazed ceramic tile. When columns are clustered together in organized rows, that's called a colonnade. And we see that being used in the large temples like Luxor and Karnak. Another Egyptian uh, design that you may be familiar with is an obelisk. And this is a symbol of authority. Um, the form originated in Egypt and it was meant to connect with the sky. So another example of things that were trying to create this connection between heaven and earth and think about where you might have seen an obelisk here in the uh, the New World or in the United States anyway. Um, and let's take a look at the next slide to see next couple of slides to see how they constructed these. What is theorized is that they used a, they built up a wooden ramp and then they filled a pit with sand, then using a sledge which is rolling logs they hoisted the obelisk up to the top of the ramp and then slowly drained the sand out until the obelisk rested in a foot plate that had a, a groove in it and then they were able to use um, if you can see on number four um, kind of a pulley system to then hoist the obelisk upright and that pivot groove stabilized it and um, then it would land on that foot plate and be uh, erect so this was thought how is that one way they could have uh, bring brought these huge heavy uh, structures up into place now let's talk about some of the domestic architecture and this would of course been a home for a wealthy person so much larger than a typical egyptian home but the typical home originally would probably just have been a single room um, similar to the small structure you see in the in the middle of the courtyard at the entrance there <clears throat> but they would have always had a flat roof for sleeping 
So as we said, it's in the desert, it's quite, quite hot. And so people would sleep out on the roof at night. And this was a tradition throughout North Africa and the Middle East um, until now. Nowadays, people don't feel as secure sleeping out on their roof, unfortunately. So um, that practice is no longer as prevalent as it used to be. But in this day, again, the people would sleep up there. Um, the structure itself is made of adobe, basically like brick, um, adobe clay. So it's clay mixed with straw and binding materials and then fired to create brick and um, built up that way. The furniture typically was just built in platforms. Wood was very scarce, so most homes did not have any kind of freestanding furniture. They had these built-in platforms made from clay. And furniture that we do see is main, was mainly for nobility or people of importance of the, in the society. Um, and so it was rare for the common person to have any furniture in the house. The very first houses actually were made from reeds. And after about 38,000 BCE, they started to be made from adobe or mud bricks. Um, there's wooden beams that hold up the roof. And you can see that with wealthy homes, they had this kind of a courtyard situation going around. The windows were small and covered with shutters to keep dust and flies and things like that out. But notice the clear story windows at the top of the wall. So think to yourself, why did they locate those windows up high on the wall? They can't see out from that location. What, um, what might have that, what would have been the purpose of having the windows in those in that position? So, this is a funerary or clay model of a middle class style house. So it still would have had a flat roof for sleeping, uh, but probably made from like two to three rooms. Um, and one room would be for storage and um, food storage and so forth. But notice they still have a small courtyard. So in those courtyards, uh, gardens were very popular and people would typically have a small pool, like a retect, uh, more of like a reflecting pool. They would have plants such as fruit trees, dates, figs, pomegranates, grapes. They grew daisies, roses, jasmine, poppies, ivy, laurel. And so again, you know, quite, quite lush because they have that water source um, to keep the plants irrigated. Another area Egyptians were quite advanced was in their use of joinery. Um, so they use different types of joints to stabilize and build their furniture. And they also use plywood. Um, so they had six layers of grain running in opposite directions to create. And those, those um, veneers glued with like the grain going 90 degrees and then the grain going you know, horizontal on the next layer. Um, and then glued creates a stronger, more flexible wood um, that's using steam and, and heat can be bent into different shapes and it doesn't warp like a solid block of wood would warp with the weather. So let's take a look at some of the other uh, common joinery that was used in Egypt. Simple mortise and tenon joints were often used. So you can see this is where we've got the one um, piece of furniture leg, say, that has the hole in it. And then if you have like a stretcher that goes across with that protrusion and fits into the hole and that stabilizes the joint. Um, they also use butt joints, which you can see was just two board, boards butted into each other at a 90 degree angle, which were much less strong and stable. Another strong and stable joint was the dovetail joint. You can see named because it's cut the no notched out in the shape of a bird's tail. And that is also seen on some of the fine furniture, such as the thrones that we see in Tutankhamun's tomb coming up, uh, was they use dovetail joints. And that's a little more stable than what's called a miter joint, where there's two um, boards, again, or pieces of wood cut at a 45 degree angle, or some type of an angle, and then joined together like a picture frame. The Egyptians were one of the first cultures to use what's called a lathe. And that's a device that helps um, create rounded forms in furniture and um, other building materials. So basically we take a, a branch of a tree, you know, uh, clean it up and use the lathe. So you can see one person is spinning 
that piece of wood um, that's stabilized upright with some kind of a leather thong. And then the other person is using a carving tool to create shapes. Um, so you can see a simple turned leg here on this stool. And notice they also used inlays. In this case, it was ebony wood that was turned on the lathe and then inlaid with ivory. So this was, um, again, first used uh, in Egypt. And, and um, there's also other evidence of it being used in later cultures. But this was an important uh, furniture building tool. And we'll see it used to great effect coming up in other centuries. So I mentioned earlier, plywood was made using these thin sheets of wood called veneers, each grain running in alternate directions, which makes the material quite strong and flexible and less likely to warp than solid wood. Um, this technique was first used in about 2600 BC in Egypt. And as a matter of fact, Cleopatra presented Julius Caesar with a plywood veneered table that had inlay. Um, so we'll see throughout the class these incredible examples of using plywood and then having it um, heated with moisture and moist heat and then bent in certain directions and then um, once the wood dries it stays in that shape. So you can see that here with this scoop seat on the stool and we'll see modern designers such as Alvar Alto take this technique you know, in the 20th or um, the 20th century and then make very you know extreme curves and bends in the plywood uh, so stay tuned that'll be coming up later in the the class wood was very scarce most of the wood most of the wooden pieces were um, made from native woods of like acacia and sycamore, um, which aren't very strong woods. They did import fir and cedar from Syria in the Middle East and wood furniture was made in pieces like a jigsaw puzzle to conserve as much wood as possible. And then they would also again shape the wood with heat and moisture to bend it. So these kinds of stools were the most common form of furniture um, seen in Egypt and the four-legged stool you can see here on the bottom like we saw on the last slide which is called a Thebes stool was used for honored guests um, most people would sit on the floor on either pillows or mats and only the honored guest sat on a stool or a chair and um, again the more wealthy the person was the more elaborate the stool the ones that you see without um, any seat would have originally had like some kind of an animal hide or sometimes even like a woven um, sisal type of seat um, like the folding stool that's to the left uh, would have originally had that on it. You can see the mortise and tendon joints connecting the legs to the saddle of the seat for this common three-legged stool that was also called a workman's stool. Uh, so this was used often, they thought people were sitting, you know, at a loom or doing something that required a lot of uh, time and concentration in one spot. But you'll see a re modern day reproduction of it. And uh, it's these kind of abstracted animal shaped legs and that kind of swoop that makes the piece quite beautiful and have lovely proportions. In the 19th century, there was a huge interest in Egypt due to um, the Battle of the Nile between the French and English forces and Napoleon bringing a whole group of artisans with him to Egypt. And they produced this volume of work, the description of Egypt, which really captured the public's imagination. So this created a whole uh, slew of what we call it Egyptian revival style furniture, which is um, witnessed with this Thebes stool that was reproduced from the original. As I mentioned in the intro, the Egyptian folding stool was a seat of importance and women were never depicted sitting on one. So they've been depicted on tomb walls from about 4,000 years ago. Uh, they were a symbol of status and importance uh, called a campaign stool also because while they were out at battle, 
the higher ups would sit on this. And so if you've ever wondered that about that term higher up or the higher ups, uh, they literally sat higher than everyone else uh, on these stools. And so they became associated with the seat of honor or um, leadership. One of the most ancient suite of furniture found is from Queen Hetaferes, who is the mother of Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid of Giza. And this is her throne chair. So it was originally, um, it's wood, it was wood, but it was encased in gold plates, which is why it stayed intact all this time. You can see on the side it has a papyrus motif, and then it has these little lion paw feet as well, which is a symbol of royalty. Um, as again, it's quite low to the ground since most people sat on the ground. Um, if even if you're on this very low throne, you were still a head higher than everyone else. Uh, so again, it's one of the oldest surviving pieces of Egyptian furniture. Along with the chair was this bed that was discovered and her tomb was actually discovered in 1925. And um, it was a reburial, it was thought, uh, from the original, the original tomb had been looted and the mummy was missing, but they did find some of these artifacts. So the head um, of the bed was elevated higher, as you can see, than the feet. And the, so it's sloped and then you have that foot rest so you don't slide off the end of the bed. Um, there's also a headrest that's part of the um, suite of furniture. And the headrest was connected to the rising sun, the symbol of rebirth. So in the, the tomb, they usually placed a headrest um, near the head of the mummy to symbolize that rebirth. So here's an Egyptian headrest. Um, again, they don't look particularly comfortable to actually sleep on, but keeping in mind they would probably have a mattress or something building it up somewhat and have some padding within the rest. But also this was designed to help people they wore very um, elaborate and ornamental hairstyles and so um, this would keep your hair from getting messed up in the night but also if you think about being in a very hot climate this would allow more airflow around your head and these types of headrests are still being used in Africa um, in cultures that do have those kind of ceremonial or, or uh, ornamental kinds of hairstyles or hair ornament ornaments um, and to just elevate your head off the ground. Another notable thing about Hetaferes is it was thought she was one of the first to have her organs embalmed. So when they prepared the mummy for burial, they would take out the vital organs and they would put them in these what's called noptic jars. So the one that has the baboon's head is uh, holding the lungs and it represents the direction of north the one with the jackal head is holding the stomach and the east. The one with the human head is holding the liver, represents the south, and the falcon head is holding the intestines, it represents the west. They left the heart and the body because they consider it the seat of the soul, but they would fish the brain out with kind of a crochet hook through the nose and discard it because they thought it had no value. This was a more common type of bed that was found in Egypt. Although beds were quite rare, most people slept on reed mats on the floor or on those mud brick platforms that were built into the side of the house. But these simple wood bed frames um, would be spanned with plated rope and or leather. Um, and this is, if you've ever heard of the origin of that phrase, good night, sleep tight, um, they would tighten the ropes across the bed. And this isn't an Egyptian saying, but beds were like this for centuries where they would have these ropes and people would need to tighten the ropes before they went to bed so that it wouldn't sag down in the night. Um, and so that's where the origin of that expression came in. Good night, sleep tight. <laughs> Hopefully your bed is nice and tight so you're comfortable. So notice the legs on this Pharaoh ceremonial chair um, shaped like a lion, paw, lion leg and lion paw foot. This is a common motif we'll see in many cultures. Also notice how the chair is elevated with those little um, pads off the ground. They use fragrant reeds and rushes on the floor. So this enabled the um, decoration of the lion paw, in this case with fancy gold nails, uh, to be visible above those fragrant reeds on the floor. 
They also um, note that these people were quite small back then, much smaller than we are today. So um, I've seen this chair in person, lucky me, um, but it's basically scaled to the size of maybe an eight-year-old, uh, ten-year-old. They're very, they're tiny, and so again, they were um, the people were smaller, you know, than they are are now. Here on the back of the throne, you see the detail of the winged sun. And this is one of the oldest Egyptian icons and symbols uh, dating back to the Old Kingdom and uses a symbol of royalty, divinity, and power, uh, not only in Egypt, but in the whole of the Near East, in Mesopotamia. And so it's a symbol for the soul and eternity, um, also often placed in temples to uh, reflect eternity and um, the eternal nature of the soul. So it was also um, evolved into a symbol of protection. And so it became a popular amulet uh, for protection that people wore as well. So you see an example of a chest here where the applied paint worn off. But what would have happened was they would take what's called gesso, which is gypsum or chalk mixed with glue to create kind of a plaster. And this created a very smooth finish with a brilliant white background to apply paint and gold leaf, like you'll see on the next slide. And then notice the knobs um, for the, the secure the top to the side of the chest. So basically they would take a leather thong and kind of do a figure eight around the knob on the top and on the side, and that's how they would secure the lid of the chest um, closed. This writing chest that you see that would have held writing implements came from the most spectacular discovery um, in Egyptian history, and that's from the tomb of Tutankhamun. And so uh, let's talk about him next. Tutankhamun was a pharaoh in the New Kingdom, and he had a short reign. Um, his name means the living image of Amun. And he's the son of Akhenaten and his sister wife, um, Nefertiti. And he ended the worship of Aten, that his father was trying to make Egypt into a monotheistic um, society. And he restored all the old gods and rebuilt the temples. So um, his name was later struck out. And so this is why people, it was thought that they didn't um, discover his tomb right away, because he was a very little known pharaoh and his name had kind of been stricken from some of the the artwork in the records through dna analysis it's thought that he might have looked something like this so he was thought to be about five feet 11 inches tall uh, walked with a cane because he had some scoliosis um, and a club foot he had a slightly cleft palate um, it was the common practice for the pharaohs to marry their half sisters so they um you know, might have had some of these um, genetic things that they've inherited from that situation. And um, he also married his half-sister. So the, um, again, this is just pure speculation what he might have looked like, but based on the DNA analysis. Who discovered his tomb was this man, Howard Carter, in the hat, who was working for the man he's shaking his hand, Lord Carnarvon, who was his sponsor. Um, Howard Carter, Carter had lived in Egypt since he was about 17. He was a really uh, wonderful artist and he had um, gotten hired to work with different teams of Egyptologists. And he himself looked for years in the Valley of the Kings to try to find a major discovery. And Carnarvon had been sponsoring him and um, Carnarvon finally said, you know, look, old chap, I cannot keep throwing money down this um, rat hole. <laughs> so I need you to, this is going to be your last season, and that's it. And you had to apply for a permit to for each season. And so, um, you know, Howard Carter was on the brink of, of ruin, really. He was going to kind of leave Egypt in disgrace when this major discovery uh, came upon him. And I'll explain how that happened on the next slide. This is the young Egyptian boy who actually discovered the stairs to the tomb. On November 4th of 1922, 
uh, this young boy who was hired to carry water to the members of the team set his water jug down on a stone and he noticed the stone was a rectangle. And so he was smart enough to get the attention of the adults and kind of point out this cut stone. And that turned out to be the top of a flight of steps cut into the bedrock. And they started to dig down through that and they found a doorway that was stamped with um, seals and these what they call a cartouche, which are oval hieroglyphic seals. And Carter ordered their staircase to be refilled and sent a telegram to Carnarvon, who arrived two and a half weeks later. And then they started to dig down again. And then when he got to the bottom of the stairs and he opened up a little chink in the wall and looked in, Carnarvon asked, can you see anything? And Carver, Carter's famous reply was, yes, wonderful things. And Carter had, in fact, discovered Tutankhamun's tomb. So you can see this stairway led down to what they call the antechamber, which had several um, layers of goods just kind of piled somewhat haphazardly, as well as the annex that had a, a chariot that was disassembled. And then they had the burial chamber with the um, sarcophagus of Tutankhamun and then the treasury, which held his mummified organs in that golden shrine. So um, he opened the sealed doorway. He found that it did lead to this burial chamber and he got the first glimpse of the sarcophagus of Tutankhamun. And um, it's one of the best preserved and most intact tombs ever found in the Valley of the Kings. Um, and this was a worldwide sensation. Uh, you know, people were, um, became Egyptian, uh, uh, an Egyptian frenzy basically started because of this um, during the 1920s. And we'll see a lot of the Art Deco designs of the 20s inspired by Egyptian motifs. So um, <clears throat> he, it took about 10 years to clear the tomb and, um, you know, catalog everything that was found inside. So the antechamber was the room that every other room was accessible from. And you can see these pile of goods that were um, collected for the pharaoh's afterlife. Um, this tomb was not as elaborate as other pharaohs from ancient Egypt were thought to have been. Um, many think, theorize that it's the fact that had had a short lifespan and there was not enough time um, to build a larger tomb for him. Um, although the tomb is very modest because again it was um, it mainly intact, it's considered very grand by our standards and very um, amazing things are found inside. Uh, and if you get a chance there, these artifacts are traveling the world right now. Um, they're building a new Museum of Antiquities in Cairo. And it said once that museum's finished, they're going to put all these artifacts from Tutankhamun's tomb in the museum and they will never travel again. So right now these artifacts are in Paris, I believe. Um, they were in LA for a while. I hope you were lucky enough perhaps to go see them up there. It was quite remarkable. Um, but again, you can check on uh, a website, I don't know, no, not sure which one, to find out where they might be going next. But um, again, these objects were probably used by the pharaoh for his everyday life. So it would be things like the animal couches. Um, these are made from wood and gilded in gold. And different things like these <clears throat> small containers of food uh, with these little servant figures um, that were to wait on the, the pharaoh in his afterlife. And uh, there were chariots that were stacked up for use um, for the pharaoh during public events. And uh, there are two large sized statues of Tutankhamun guarding the entrance into the burial chamber. This room called the treasury um, shows a um, shrine that is being guarded by four goddesses. And inside this shrine holds the mummified organs of Tutankhamun. And they're in little uh, coffin shaped chests that resemble Tutankhamun that were inside alabaster jars. And um, they also are showing the god Anubis, that jackal figure that's guarding the organs as well. 
and the goddesses are guarding them. And then you can see the boats in the background that were um, also to be used by the pharaoh in the afterlife. Here we see the sarcophagus, which is the, and the outer layer, which is from red quartzite, uh, which is carved stone. And this protected three man-shaped coffins. The first two were made of wood, um, cedar and oak, with gilding, and the last coffin was of solid gold. And the mummy had about 150 amulets all over it, um, as well as the gold death mask that we'll see coming up on the, the, one of these next slides. These are some of the coffinets that held Tut's organs, and you can see it's depicted with the pharaoh holding the crook and the flail, which are symbols of the authority of the pharaoh. Um, and the shepherd's crook, or the curved piece, was stood for kingship and the flail for the fertility of the land. Um, so again, they were um, used as a, a kind of a symbol of the pharaoh's power. Here we see one of the most famous pieces of art in the world, the death mask of Tutankhamun, and <clears throat> the, probably the most famous piece of um, work from Egyptian antiquity. And it's the death mask that was on site on top of the mummy <clears throat> on his face. And it's um, one foot, 0.8 feet tall, weighs 22 pounds. You can see it has the cobra and the vulture, the cobra representing lower Egypt and the vulture upper Egypt. And then the blue lines representing the sky, the gold lines, the sun. And the color with the different beautiful gemstones of lapis lazuli, malachite, amber, and jasper carnelian representing the colors of the dawn sky so a symbol for rebirth again and um, this was also besides the mask uh, there was three strands of, of beads with lotus which symbolizes rebirth and then all these other amulets all wrapped in the mummy's wrappings and all around the outside of the mummy to ensure him safe passage into the afterlife Another object from the tomb that was clutched in the mummy's hand was this dagger. And for many years, this dagger was a source of great mystery because the um, metal that it was made from didn't rust. And it was found to be, recently found, to be iron from a meteorite. So there were meteorites that struck the desert, and this was made from that meteorite. And we'll see another piece of jewelry coming up uh, with a bright yellow <clears throat> glass in it. And that bright yellow glass is from when the meteorite hit the hot uh, sand of the Egyptian desert and formed a kind of a molten glass effect. And they made a scarab out of this bright yellow glass. It's also in the tomb. Here we sing Tutankhamun's father, um, Akhenaten. And actually Tutankhamun's original name was Tutankhaten, um, which was the living image of Aten. And Tutan, or Akhenaten, his father, was trying to reform uh, Egyptian religion to create a monotheistic religion with the worship of the um, god Aten, who's the disk of the rising sun. And he wanted this god to be worshipped to the exclusion of all the others. And it was thought it was really a way to try to minimize the power of the priests. The priests had gotten quite powerful, and the priests of Amun and so um, it was thought that perhaps he was trying to overthrow the priests or diminish them in power. But he's also famous for being the husband of Nefertiti, um, his wife who, her bust that's painted limestone uh, was found in a um, workman's shop uh, by some German archeologists. It's now, this bust is in Berlin and she's said to be the most beautiful um, form of art of of a woman in art i guess from antiquity now what's unusual about this bust of nefertiti um again mary Takanaden, is that she is shown wearing a priest hat a male priest hat so it was thought that perhaps akhenaten was trying to elevate her to be his co-ruler and she also had a tomb built for her that was quite large, which was unusual again at the time. Her name literally means the beauty has come, and she's known for this long swan-like neck. Uh, this famous statue was found in a sculptor's workshop, and again, it's become another um, 
iconic treasure from ancient Egypt. When King Tutankhamun's tomb was opened in 1922, there was a sensational amount of riches and some wonderful examples of Egyptian furniture. As a matter of fact, there are about 50 pieces of royal furniture in the tomb, and this is one of them. You can see the Hathor um, cow heads with the sun disk in between. And so notice the animal shaped legs. Um, this will be something that we'll see both, both in Egypt and in Mesopotamia. Um, so that this cache of furniture included armchairs, armless chairs, a number of stools, um, some folding, some four-legged, different, several different beds, some of them, one of them fold, uh, folds for travel, and 30 different chests of different sizes and designs. One of the impressive pieces of furniture that was found is this ceremonial throne. And this was meant to look as if it was a folding chair, but in fact it did not fold. But you can see that X base on it. Um, and it has a dish wooden seat that's made of ebony uh, inlaid with ivory and sort of a leopard pattern. Uh, they also have these kind of uh, bits of red leather that were visible under the seat. And you can see on the front legs, there's that golden um, papyrus motif. And you can see the papyrus is woven, woven together, symbolizing the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. And um, this was also, these types of chairs would include a footstool so that the king could rest his feet while seated. This incredible chair is the golden throne from Tutankhamun's tomb and it's encased almost entirely in gold. It also has some inlays of silver and lapis lazuli, uh, translucent crystal and faience, uh, which we'll talk about in a more in a moment. Notice the lion paw feet and the lion heads on the front of the chair to represent royalty. And there also on the sides, you can see some cobras and those wings of Horus, uh, the wings of vultures that are sweeping along the side of the chair. And there's also symbolism to, again, show the unification of Upper and Lower Egypt. And um, this all adds up to this incredible piece of furniture that is the uh, throne chair from King Tut's tomb. The last thing we'll see from Tutankhamun's tomb is this image of King Tut at war riding upright in a chariot, uh, which is an idealized portrait. Um, he died when he was 18, um, and there's a, evidence that he had broken his left leg, maybe die of an infection from that break. There was also malaria in his system. And so again, this was um, an idealized version of him uh, being very strong and, and able to stand up in the chariot. On this slide, note the Kekker motif on the cornice above the doorway. So again, those are those stylized patterns that were meant to represent papyrus stalks in bundles. And it's a common motif that we'll see used in Egyptian design. And remember the papyrus is the symbol of Lower Egypt. And it was also a very important plant because they, it was a food source. They made uh, paper from it. They made boats from it. Um, and we'll see it's a dominant motif in their architectural and decorative arts as well. So these are um, designs of Kekker patterns um, and a few lotus patterns and papyrus as well. But that whole top band across the image, those are all different Kekker patterns. And there's a bit, like I said, there was a big movement towards Egyptian revivalism in the 1800s. And that's when these plates were reproduced. So people looked at some of the uh, artifacts and then um, stylized them and made them more graphic to be used again in decorative arts in the 1800s. But again, that top row is the Kekker patterns. Chevrons, or those up and down zigzags, are a notable motif. And we'll see them used in Egypt, but we'll also see them used a lot in Mesopotamia, which we'll talk about next class. And this is still a pattern that we see used quite a bit today. 
So as you go about, um, you know, you look at ceramic tile patterns, uh, you can see the rugs on the next slide, um, even in fashion, all different um, ceramic wear, we'll see these kind of zigzag patterns still being used. A cartouche is that oval shape that you see with the line below it, and that represents a nameplate. So with those hieroglyphics within that oval typically will name a king or sometimes a queen, uh, the pharaoh and his queen. And um, these were a mystery for many, many years until Champion, a French a linguistic expert, cracked the code with the Rosetta Stone. And um, again, we'll see that cartouche motif being used again in Baroque style in a few centuries from now, or several centuries from now. The Rosetta Stone that was discovered in 1799 uh, actually helped crack the code to Egyptian hieroglyphics. Prior to that, people didn't really know anymore what these symbols represented. And um, because they found this stone that had two, um, had a decree written in ancient hieroglyphics, more contemporary hieroglyphics, and then into ancient Greek, this is during the Hellenistic period of Greece, um, they were able to decipher what the hieroglyphics meant. And so uh, Jean Champion, who went um, on to decode it further, uh, published his findings in 1822. And this is another thing that uh, caused a big interest in Egyptian design is that they were finally able to understand what the hieroglyphics meant in those symbols. Okay, here we two, see two important plants and symbols to the Egyptians. On the left is the blue Egyptian water lily <clears throat> that represents the upper Nile. And on the right, the white Egyptian lotus, um, and that re represents rebirth and creation itself because the lotus closes at night and then reopens in the day. Um, and then the blue lily also represented a sense of joy and, and um, to to party, really, they, there's different images of the Egyptians smelling the blue lotus, and the blue lotus um, scent was said to have a mild narcotic effect. So we'll see in the next slide some artwork depicting people smelling the blue lotus. And then uh, the lotus motif is an important architectural motif that we'll see coming up. So a capital is that decorative part on the upper part of the column shaft <clears throat> that attaches to the architrave or the lintel, the horizontal span that's helping to support the roof. And Egyptians did very decorative capitals. And in this case, it's what's called a lotus capital. So if you can picture that lotus flower we just saw, this is the lotus flower in bloom. And again, the lotus represents Southern Egypt or upper, the upper Nile. And um, we'll see this quite a bit used on some of the temples in that region. This is showing different variations of some of the Egyptian capitals, both the open lotus, the closed lotus, the papyrus, and the date palm, which we'll talk about next. This is the closed lotus form of the capital. So if you can picture again that um, at night that the flower closes and then opens again, um, it's a symbol of rebirth and recreation. Papyrus seen here is a very important water plant that grows all along the, back, the banks of the Nile. And it was used for all kinds of things from woven mats to ropes, to fabric, utensils, um, using they bundled it together to create boats and rafts, and they made paper from it by cutting the um, stalk of the plant into thin strips and then soaking that in water to remove the sugars. Then they pound it down the fibers, similar to when, how Polynesians make tapa cloth, same kind of effect. Um, and then they weave it together at right angles to form a sheet and then pound it again into a felt-like texture and then flatten it with a heavy stone. So you'll see that coming up in a slide or two, some of the papyrus paper, <clears throat> but they also used it as a motif for their architecture. 
So the next slide will show you a papyrus shaped capital. And here we see a date palm, which was an important food source, especially in the desert during times of drought. Um, as you might know, dates are very high in nutrients and potassium and very important when you're in hot climate to keep those levels up. So the uh, date palm, because it was such an important food source, is also seen on the architecture for more uh, domestic dwellings and so forth, not as much in temples. Uh, but you'll see a capital of the date palm next, or date palm capital on the next slide. I had mentioned hieroglyphics and this symbology that created writing for the Egyptians. And you can see they use birds quite a bit as symbols. And one important symbol was the god Horus, or represented by a falcon who is the god of the sky, the sun and the moon, also the god of protection and war, and was the symbol of the pharaoh in life. So um, this will be when you see um, these falcon symbols, that usually is rep talking about a pharaoh. Here we see another important Egyptian symbol, which is the Ankh. And it symbolizes many things, including physical life now, uh, eternal life and immortality, plus death and reincarnation. So it said the teardrop shape represents um, the sun coming up over the horizon and then setting again. And um, again, this is the symbol that just is the word life for the Egyptians. So oftentimes you'll see um, in funerary artwork, the Ankh, um, draped over the arm of the pharaoh to wish them eternal life. The Egyptians used quite a bit of these composite beings as symbols, and the lion symbol was a royal symbol that was connected with the sun and a symbol of the horizon also. So as we've learned from other symbols, that typically again means rebirth, the sun coming up and then setting again and coming up the next day. In this case, that's paired with the Pharaoh's face. Um, and so the fact that, you know, that is trying to show the power of the Pharaoh along with the power of the sun. Um, and so these are, um, when they have these kind of composite beings, it's usually trying to take the strength of one. And um, for example, next, class will talk about the Lamassu in Mesopotamia, which uses the head of the man to show intelligence, the wings of a bird to show swiftness, and the body of a bull to show strength. And so these composite beings usually are trying to, you know, bring those ideas together in one powerful image. One of the sacred images for Egyptians were cats. Uh, Egyptians believed cats were magical creatures and that they were capable of bringing good luck uh, to the family who housed them. So they were treated as very much honored pets and they were often clad in jewelry and they were mummified after they died. Um, and another thing that you might consider is that cats were helping um, keep you know rodents and things like that at bay that were you know getting into food store uh, sources so there were several ancient egyptian deities depicted with cat-like heads and um, they often were representing justice fertility and power so um, again cats were praised for not only killing rodents but also venomous snakes and um, being protectors for the family Here we see what's called an Ujat or Eye of Horus, a symbol of the god Horus. And it has to do with a legend uh, due to his father Osiris uh, having a battle with Seth, the god of the underworld. And Seth killed Osiris and then Horus battled Seth and lost his left eye and Seth tore it into pieces. And then it was reassembled. So it goes along with the um, idea of um, protection becomes it has now become synonymous with protection, royal power, 
good health and rejuvenation. And the different parts of this symbol represent different parts of your senses too, which we'll discuss um, when I go through this again with you guys. Uh, also, I, interestingly enough, the structure of the eye of Horus is similar to the pineal gland in our brain. Um, so it's thought perhaps the Egyptians mummifying bodies might have seen this particular structure in the brain and use that as a template for this particular um, symbol. And it also has divine proportion. So the way it's broken down into quarters, you know, a half, sixteenth, etc., cetera, uh, shows that kind of rhythmic expansion. see a small Yashapti figure, which were figurines that were made to be servants to the pharaoh in the afterlife. Um, and this is made from faience. So faience is a glass-like substance uh, that at first was used in Egypt about 4000 BC and then evolved as an art form until it was used in quite a few different um, areas. So it was used by making powdered quartz. Um, Kind of a silicate with a binding agent such as sodium carbonate and a, this kind of a salt found in nature and then they were used to then press into molds and um, often in this beautiful turquoise color so the Nile is symbolized in the color of the water but often the different types of things that are being made from faience are also water animals so we'll see a hippopotamus on the next slide um, so this hippopotamus is um, decorated with lotus flowers, where we talked about the symbolism of the lotus. And uh, they were, hippos, you might not be aware, are the most dangerous animal in Africa. They kill more people than anything else. So um, the hippo, on the next slide again, the, the, um, there's many hippos in the Nile. And so that was another um, being that they were, were dealing with in their life. This hippo now lives in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. It's kind of an unofficial mascot there. And um, this one, you can see again, was made in a mold. So they could take that glass-like substance and pour it into a mold for these kinds of decorative objects or also things like vases and vessels, which we'll see in the next few slides. And then they can incise it, meaning they can carve into it um, to create these decorative patterns like you see in the lotus patterns on the hippo. So again, faience, also called Egyptian paste, um, is this glassy substance manufactured by grinding quartz or sand crystals together with various amounts of sodium, potassium, and calcium, and magnesium, as well as copper oxide, depending on the colors they're producing. And then they're using some plant ash uh, from the sodium. And um, this art form is over 5,000 years old, uh, but it was used extensively throughout Egypt. and um, We'll see examples of faience used in other cultures from this time period as well. Alabaster was used for many purposes, and they used a type that's kind of like a, it's an onyx, um, which is a calcium carbonate, and um, what we also call is kind of a gypsum or calcium sulfate. Anyway, it's this beautiful stone that can be carved easily and it's quite translucent. So you'll see on the next slide that they also used it for oil lamps. Um, and we still use alabaster today for light fixtures. A lot of uh, lighting will have an alabaster uh, shade. And, um, you know, again, this is something that's been used since ancient times. Beauty was an important um, aspect to Egyptians, and beauty was regarded as a sign of holiness. So cosmetics to them had a spiritual aspect, and they also had a functional purpose. So they used green eye paint from grinding up the stone malachite uh, to create eyeliner. They used coal, which is a type of charcoal uh, that has lead in it. But these had uh, a impact in that if you've ever been outside in the bright sun, by having your eyes rimmed in black, it helped uh, deal with the glare of the bright sun from the desert. 
They also used a blush made from red ochre and henna that's still used today to paint nails and dye their hair. Um, the coal also helped with eye infections because it has nitric oxide in it and that creates an immune response in the eye. So they're bathing in the Nile or, you know, with Nile water, that's, you know, where animals live in it and so forth. So the coal helped reduce, um, you know, the amount of bacteria that might be getting into their eyes from using that wa untreated water. To show how important cosmetics were to them, this is actually a ceremonial palette. So they would use these palettes to grind up those things like the coal and the malachite and the ochre uh, to apply their, their makeup. <clears throat> and this Normer palette's two feet tall. So this was actually made as a ceremonial uh, item to be presented to a pharaoh, the Pharaoh's tomb. And it's one of the earliest hieroglyphics found, um, named for King Normer of the first dynasty. And he was the pharaoh that unified Upper and Lower Egypt. So again, this is um, showing the importance of the cosmetics, you know, to the culture. The use of bright colors <clears throat> had symbolism to the Egyptians as well. So things like red tones made from iron oxide and red ochre represented life. And it also could represent the god Set or Seti that meant destruction. Blue, uh, which they would create using copper iron oxides, meant fertility and rebirth in the Nile itself. So it meant the life-giving force of the Nile and the water. Blue was also a symbol associated with protection. Yellow was associated with the sun, of course, and eternity. Green, uh, using malachite and copper to create those tones, tended to represent growth and life itself, also rebirth and renewal. Uh, white, used from chalk and gypsum, another mineral, represented purity and clarity, often identified with the priestly class or ritual objects. And black, um, taking carbon from charcoal, burnt wood, would of course represent death. Not of course, some cultures black does not represent death, but for them it did. Um, also the underworld, but also birth and the soil from the Nile. So the colors all uh, were placed with intention. They also diluted the colors to make softer tones like purple, pinks, and teal and with the accents of gold and silver leaf. And um, you have to put it all into a context of imagery to get how the color symbolism is being used. But again, they were done with intention. Another important Egyptian symbol is the scarab. And it's a symbol of immortality uh, resurrection, transformation, and protection. And that's that beetle form in the middle of this particular piece of jewelry or amulet. Um, when we see a winged scarab like this, these were typically placed on the heart of the mummy. And the reason for that, again, is this is a symbol of um, transformation and resurrection. So it was also a way to protect the heart of the mummy, because remember they believed the heart was the seat of the soul. Um, the scarab beetle, the true beetle um, eats dung or poop and lays their eggs in it and also feeds their young for it. So it's another symbol of representing life emerging from the muck, if you will, like the lotus emerging from the muddy water. Um, it was first used as a symbol in old, the Old Kingdom of Egypt. But again, we'll see lots of these scarabs used, um, and this one's carved in lapis lazuli, with again those wings and it's also associated with the god that was said to bring the sun up over the eastern horizon every morning so it's also considered a symbol of manifestation um, of that early morning sun and you see that solar disk on this particular design so with that in mind this is how the throat of hetaferis would have looked with those colors representing those different spiritual aspects and again um, being very brightly colored also the fact that they were using gesso that just gypsum again to create that smooth plaster like effect on the wood and create that ideal paint base for both the gilding the gold parts of the chair and the painting to create smooth finishes they're using tempera 
type of paint. Um, so again, that creates these kind of pure colors. So if you can notice those fragments of color on the um, hieroglyphics here, this is what the tombs and things originally looked like. They were, again, very brightly colored. And over time, the color has worn off. Um, so they were doing uh, fresco secco, which is on a wet, uh, sorry, dry surface, painting on dry plaster versus wet plaster, so that those um, colors eventually kind of eroded off on most cases. But you'll see a couple examples coming up of areas where the color stayed intact. So to wrap up our first class, uh, Egyptian design has been very much fascinating people for centuries, and we will see that that comes um, there's revivals of Egyptian design in different time periods that we'll be st uh, studying in the class, from the Napoleonic era and the Empire style to the Victorian revival styles of the 1800s the Art Deco revivalism that was sparked by the discovery in Tutankhamun's tomb. So Egypt continues to fascinate us uh, even to today. And um, I hope you enjoyed this very brief tour of some of their key design features. Thank you.